Hi, I'm Kendra Little from Red Gates Advocate Team, and I'm going to show you how you can set up a SQL change automation project with Azure SQL Database. To get started, I have a few databases set up on a SQL Server in Azure. And by SQL Server, I mean an Azure SQL Database SQL Server here. I could be using in real life, I could have multiples of these, and that would work as well. But for convenience purposes for demo, what I have in a single place is a database that represents a development database for an existing project. So let's say I've got an existing production database in Azure DevOps that I want to get into source control. You can also do what I'm doing with new development. It's a little bit simpler. So with most folks already having an environment they want to get into source control, I'm showing you how to get an existing database into source control. Also have a third database on the instance that is set up for me to run builds against it. And this means that not only can I get my database into source control and uh, make changes to it, but after I do things like push my branch up to a centralized Git repository, in something like a pull request workflow, I can automate builds that validate my code as part of that PR so that anyone reviewing my code doesn't have to worry about does this code compile correctly? Is it in the right shape? We can do that automatically and set up continuous integration for my database. So I'm starting off as, as if from scratch here. And the first thing I'm going to do in Azure DevOps is I'm gonna create a new project. You don't have to use Azure DevOps with SQL change automation. You could use Octopus Deploy, you could use Jenkins, you could use all sorts of other functionality, but with uh, databases like Azure SQL Database, right, which is an Azure specific hosted database, a lot of people who use that do tend to use Azure DevOps. So it makes sense to do that in this demo. So let's just name this Azure Demo as my project. And I am using the default settings that Microsoft recommends when you create a new project. Microsoft recommends that you use Git for the repo. So I'm just going to use a uh, repo in my Azure DevOps project. You could do other things, right? You could use a GitHub repo. You could do all sorts of other things. But this is the most common workflow that we're seeing with folks who want to use Azure SQL Database these days. I've got my project here. And if I go to my repo, we'll see that it says, by the way, uh, this is a new repo, and so it's empty. We should add some code. And what I'm going to do is clone this repo to my development workstation. I'm going to click this button which will copy the address of the repo to my clipboard. So if I copy this, let's go ahead and get rid of all of my existing PowerShell windows there. I'm gonna go to uh, wherever I keep my source control locally. I happen to have mine in a folder just named Git on the C drive. And I'm gonna say Git clone and then paste in the address of that repo. The repo is empty, but it will clone down that empty repo to my desktop and give me a folder to work in where I can make changes in there. And sure enough, it says, yes, you have cloned this into a folder named Azure Demo, but it is in fact empty. So sure enough, if we go into Azure Demo and we do a directory listing, there is no nothing there. What we're gonna do now is set up the project in SQL change automation and get our database into version control in this location, then we'll push it up to the central repo. In Management Studio, I have SQL Server Management Studio open here, and I have a tool called SQL Change Automation open. This is a Redgate tool, and the steps I'm doing here you could do in Visual Studio as well. If you prefer using Visual Studio, SQL Change Automation also has an extension for Visual Studio, and one of the cool things is when you create a project with SQL Change Automation, your teammates can, if they like working in Visual Studio, they can collaborate on the project there. If your teammates like working in Management Studio, they can use it to collaborate. People can use the tool that they want and work on the exact same project. If you switch them back and forth between the tools, you can use both tools yourself if you like. We're gonna create a new project for our database. We're gonna name it Azure Demo. We're gonna browse to that directory we created, right? I just cloned this directory down. And I'm gonna say, I want to put my project there. When we script out the initial database and when we make changes to the database, that's the directory that we're gonna keep it in. And then we need to set the development source. With an existing database, if you're already doing development for this, 
Even if you weren't using version control already, you may already have an existing development database. And that may or may not be in the exact same state as the production database, right? Your dev database might be ahead a little bit. You might have changes in it that haven't been deployed yet to production. Or maybe it's even missing some objects that aren't in production because, oops, we didn't keep them in sync, right? So we are going to tell this not only where our dev database is, but in a couple screens, we're going to tell it where a copy of production is so that we can, as part of getting the database into source control, identify, OK, is development in the same state as production? If you don't already have a new, an existing development database, you, of course, could create a fresh database for your development work if you wanted to. So I'm going to connect to my Azure DevOps instance here, and I'm going to uh, give it my info to authenticate, and then I'm going to tell it what database is my development database. And in this case, Azure Demo is our development database. So we say OK, and it gets that set as our development source. So when we make changes to that development source, it'll look at them and be like, oh, I'm going to look for new things in here to automatically script out for you because it looks like you've changed this dev database and want to make changes in your pipeline. I click Next here, and it gives me a few options. If I want to filter out things from my development database, and like perhaps I have objects in my dev database I just don't want to ship to production, that's fine. I can set up, uh, if that is the case, I can set up a filter file using SQL Compare and save that filter file as a .scpf file and then tell it, hey, just ignore this stuff. Never import this stuff into version control. If I want to edit my comparison options, I can do that as well. So, And this has a lot of cool things in it. Perhaps I want to, here's one of my uh, new recent favorites, perhaps I want to default to using online equals on when I create indexes. Because when I deploy them, I want to minimize the amount of locking and blocking that I create. right? So I can set that as an option. And we even have some experimental items. If you prefer to use the new create or alter syntax, in SQL Server for your programmable objects. For things like stored procedures, you can check that off. We would love your feedback on that feature. Sometimes when we're first adding something and changing the behavior of something we've had in the product for a while, we label it as experimental so that you can decide if you want to do things the way you've already done it, if you've been using the project for a while, or you can just use you know, the, it in the new way, if you like. All right, I'm going to click Next here. And now we get to the baseline screen. Baselining is only for cases where you have an existing production database. If you're starting out with a new code base and there is no production database yet, then just click don't baseline, right? Because what a baseline is, is a representation of your production environment. The way that we're going to be developing changes here, we're going to be doing things like allowing you to uh, customize your changes in, in a way. So, if you want to you know, create an index with online equals on, right? it'll automatically script that for you. But perhaps you want to do another thing and, and set the you know, fill factor specifically on that index to something in the code, but not anywhere else. right? We need to test that that command, as you have customized it, whether it's something that inserts data, updates data, deletes data, or does a schema change, we need to test that that works against the foundation of the existing production database. And that's what that baseline representation allows us to test is, does your command work against the, the state of your starting point plus any changes that you've made? So you want to create a baseline schema against either your production database. But what most folks do is they do a copy of the production database. Now, in Azure uh, DevOps, and let me go ahead and authenticate uh, to connect to this database. In Azure DevOps, it lets you uh, create a copy of a database uh, using either T-SQL or PowerShell or all sorts of options. So you can go ahead and do that to get a representation of that database. Or you could script out the contents of that database and then use something with that schema as the source of this. So I'm going to say we want to connect to, in this case, Azure Demo Deploy as the what we want to generate the baseline from. So I click OK there, and now I'm going to click Create My Project. And at this point, what it's doing is it's going out and 
creating a baseline script that is the representation of what that production database is and setting up the files in my project. Now my project has been set up. It generated the baseline script and it now says, okay, here's the next step. We can now review differences between the dev database and the baseline state because we want to know, is there extra stuff in development? Are we missing stuff in development? What's up with that? And we'll do that by clicking the check for changes button here at the top right. We are going to go ahead and do that. And it will look at that database. Now, while it's working there, I can actually go over to the migrations tab here and I can explore what's happening. So it's doing that check for me. And meanwhile, I'm just showing you essentially, it created that baseline script and it automatically named it. It put it in a folder named 1.0.0.baseline and it gave it a name indicating when it was created and who it was created by. I'm logged in as IMDBA. I can rename this script if I would like. Um, that's totally fine. And it also created a new folder for me, 1.0.0.changes. You can create folders over time to organize things in accord with however you do your software development, however you manage your sprints or releases. You can use the buttons here to create new folders. You can also look at things in Windows File Explorer. Uh, there's a button that opens it there if you want to examine your files in Windows there. So let's head back to that generate uh, migrations things. And it says, oh, your, my databases are actually happen to be in sync. You know, if they weren't in sync, it would let me know what was up there. So generate migrations would tell me if I didn't have things, if I had things in my development database that weren't in source control, apply to database would tell me if I had things in source control that were not in my development database and I was missing things. That is the basics on how we get set up, but let's, before we, before we forget, let's actually commit these changes to source. I could do this in the IDE of my choice if I wanted to. So if I wanted to do this in my get command line interface, if I say get status in here, it will um, say, okay, you're on branch master and you don't have any commits yet and you do have some untracked files that are in the Azure demo folder. So if I wanted to manage this in here, I could, but it makes it very convenient for me to also do this in the SQL change automation tool. And it even gives me a little more info. On this tab, it says, oh, here are all of the files that are uncommitted so that you want to review them. We have a SQL proj file and oh, mm, we have a SQL proj dot user file. Wait a second. I probably don't want to commit dot user files to source control. There is an additional step we should take when setting up a project. So I'm going to do a search on SQL change automation, git ignore. And let's see, I'm using uh, Bing's uh, source control here. And sure enough, it did come up with the documentation. Good job, Bing. <laughs> like to joke that it's a decision engine. It made the decision to show me this page on using version control in SSMS. Now, when you're using um, Visual Studio, it automatically creates .gitignore files for you. In SSMS, the tool isn't as savvy and SSMS in general, it doesn't have all that built-in stuff. So if you want to configure gitignore, which I recommend that you do, and you're creating the project in Visual Studio, you want to go ahead and add a gitignore file to this. So I'm going to click on configured gitignore file. And this tells me that generally you want to ignore these files we can download a sample gitignore file for SQL change automation. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that and I'm going to show it in the folder. I can actually double click on this and copy the gitignore file. And then I'm just going to go into my git folder here into my Azure demo project and I'm going to go ahead and paste in that gitignore file that I just downloaded. If you'd like to uh, view it, you can open the file and these are including my SQL.proj.user, these tell Git, hey, don't commit these, don't check these in. Now, if I go back to my version control tab in SQL change automation, and I just clicked on version control to have it reload, notice that now it says, oh, <laughs> yes, I see you have a .gitignore file. And Git, based on seeing that .gitignore file, notice that it has the SQL proj file, but it doesn't have the .sql proj file.user. Only one person needs to do this when you're setting up your project if you're using SSMS, right? Because I will be checking the git ignore into source 
So everyone using the project will have access to that Git ignore. When they clone it down, they'll have the Git ignore in there and they will automatically ignore files there. I'm gonna name this initial commit. <laughs> they say never type in a demo for a reason. I think I spelled that right. And I'm gonna go ahead and push this up to my repo. Now, before I push, I'll note I am in the master branch. I could change branches in the tool if I want using this little drop down carrot and we'll do something like that in future demos. But let's say for my initial commit, I don't wanna do a pull request workflow. And at this point, I'm still, you know, I'm just setting up the repo and maybe at this point, I'm allowing this initial push to go directly to the master branch. Let's see if I can go back to uh, the correct project here. I think I may have uh, multiple windows open here. So we wanna go to RG demos and we want to check in our Azure demo project there. Making sure I'm in the right project is half the battle. And we can see now that sure enough, I pushed my initial commit up to the repo. And now I have, if I examine this, we can see I have tables in my schema model. And if I expand my baseline script here, I have my baseline script for that as well. So this is how if you have an Azure SQL database, you can quickly get the project into source control using Azure DevOps and SQL change automation.